Well, to start out by winding the clock back a few years, um, all we had to go on was this latest album of yours. Yes. Um, and so, it, you know, sort of getting bio material from the record company, we would find that you had been in a band. Yeah, I'll get his first stuff as well that he can take out and analyze okay. if you want. Okay, with it. No, it's not big, it's just a recent resume, which okay, would probably great. help you to great. get things in chronological order yeah. and speed things up for okay. you. Yeah, great. That's great. Uh, yeah, he was surprised to Not find all pop stars are this efficient. <laughs> <laughs> he was surprised to find that you had been in, in London, and, and I guess a band called London SS. And, um, that is one of the myths that I have to go around the world dispelling. Kind mm. of. Um, it's true that I did once. Uh, it's a long story. I did once uh, find out I was phone up for an audition with them. Mm -hmm. They never actually did any gigs. The London SS were more of an idea, as far as I know, mm -hmm. as far as Captain knows, because Captain sensible something to do with them as well. Mm, I see. The London SS was the Getting together in 1975, I'd been in a glam rock band called The Mighty Plod prior to that. We were like a cross between the New York Dolls and the Sweet. The Mighty Plod? Yeah, The Mighty Plod. That was a glam rock band. You know, all mm -hmm. Ricky's in Baco for Touch of the Makeup. Back on both era. But this was early on, the 73 to 75. Mm. When that band finished, I was looking for a band and I saw an advert in the paper for a band called London SS and I spoke to a guy for about an hour on the phone. I really liked the ideas I was hearing. Uh, I had another audition to go, I didn't go to that one. Mm -hmm. What London SS was important, not for what it was, is what came out of it, because also concerned with that idea, people who were mm. on the edges of it were people like Brian James, Billy Idol, Captain Sensible, in other words, all the people who came to form punk. Mm -hmm. But the London SS as a band, although mm. much vaunted as a legend, and it, everyone said that, that you know, it came out of that, um, didn't really exist, and I wasn't really in them. Mm -hmm. But uh, oh, yeah, wait, the, the I've been in touch with them, put it that way. Oh, yeah. So wait, so the band never really left behind any recordings, or never even actually. As far materialized. as I know, there are no records, and I don't think they even played a gig. But it was an idea that was being talked about. You mm -hmm. see, in England, mm -hmm. we'd had a load of the English were just producing bands like Yes, Genesis. You know, boring bearded bastards, basically. <laughs> and uh, and then we were having a lot of American stuff over, which was also very very boring for young teenagers. Stuff like the Eagles. Uh, Steely Dan were good. They were an exception. Steely Dan I loved. But um, they were like Beatles with jazz chords. That's the best description I've got of them. But uh, the Doobie Brothers. Basically, bands of stoned American 30-somethings who were just lying back in Los Angeles strumming guitars and singing really laid-back songs and I must say I hated it and, and also the same people over here patting each other on the back it was a little rather inelegant coterie of what we saw as sort of sleepy old men who were really out of touch with what was going on and something needed changing so yeah punk really came out of that but it took about a year 18 months to get going mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. Sex Pistols. Well, that's an old So, you know, the glam rock was a very visual thing, but at the same time, sort of mainstream pop as well. Had you wanted to get in on the mainstream? Yeah, I, I wanted to be a pop star. I didn't right. want to piss about being a fucking rock star. Mm -hmm. I didn't care about musical credibility. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a pop star. I liked the rubbish. And, uh, you know, I mean, I prefer. I liked David Bowie, but I preferred bands like Slade and Sweet. Mm -hmm. I liked, you know, because it came from the working class, you know. And uh, I wasn't into all this poncy middle class artiness. I just wanted to get on a you know, stage and make a racket and, and ponce about in women's clothes and you know, annoy people and be all the things that my parents hated, basically. Standard English rock and roll rebel <laughs> stuff, you know. That's right. So, you more than a, you saw this, sort of an attitude type thing, an image type thing that you were going for. Yeah, right. Rather, um, rather than music per se. You know, I was 19 uh -huh. and uh, full of drink. And my main idea was uh, really um, playing. Oh, I did like music, but you know, I, I was very fond of it. I lived and breathed it. But mm -hmm. the idea was make a racket, get on stage, dress up, get some girlfriends, get some drink, and then uh, get enough money so I could um, go and have a place to do it all in, you know. But of course. The, that didn't happen. It took some time. You know. <laughs> so, how long? Wait, what are we talking about in terms of uh, time period? Like, 
Oh, so, wait, I mean, this was back in the mid-70s, you so know. So right? is this so the about when I was seventh, in yeah. 1973 or 1970. So, 1973 is about when you try, first tried that? Well, that's when I was first doing a proper band. I mean, right. I'd kicked around in school bands and, mm -hmm. you know, done this and that. But, of course, you know, the drugs went away. I used to take loads and loads of pet pills. But, uh, that, that's not important, but the fact of the matter is, usual retarded youth. It wasn't until I was about 19, my hormones w woke up my... My the drugs got out of my system, and I suddenly thought, well, if I'm going to do this, I suppose I'd better straighten up and get myself in a band and start doing it for real. And that's what I did. Yeah. And then we were up and down the road doing, you know, scuzzy little pubs and, mm. you know, clubs, basically learning my apprenticeship. Right. We weren't very good, but we looked brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, no, 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 no. It's all. Oh, I've lost me looks now, but uh, no, I was a good-looking lad in my youth, yeah. I don't think... Hmm. So we are given to understand that by the early 80s you were in a band called Cleaners from... That's Green exactly Cleaners. right, yeah. yeah. Which was sort of a psychedelic, a British psychedelic outfit. Well, they were called cool psychedelic. I suppose we were, really, but it's by this time I, I'd been several years in bands, come up against a record company barrier, um, had a solo record out, had rather a lot of publicity for one of my solo records and that had kind of scared me um, and I thought there must be some other way of selling music other than by the uh, music industry so me and this friend, we had very little equipment started making these um, demo tapes on a four track machine at home and we'd send them to everybody but uh, the record companies in fact, you know that copyright sign, a C with a circle and a all rights reserved. We used to have one of them with a line through it and then no rights reserved, copy this tape and write things like um, no record companies please. We were absolutely against the music industry. I thought, I thought it was a way to push things through. Mm -hmm. I started a kind of network of other people throughout the world who found this stuff. In fact, some of those networks still exist, but I joined other people who also felt the same way and we used to exchange tapes by post. post I'd sell stuff in pubs. Um, and I'd create these little kind of Phil Spector garage masterpieces and every few months then we'd, we'd package them up, do some covers for them and sell them by post or people could order them through alternative music shops and things. And that went on for some years. Why did you try to sort of uh, rebel against the existing music industry structure? Um, because I thought they were a bunch of capitalist uh, bastards and um, and I thought they were stupid. Um, I'd become quite politicised at that point. I was hanging out with a very political woman and she only reinforced my opinions. Yeah, I thought they were stupid. I thought it was stupid businessmen and I thought a lot of good music was going through the net. And uh, I thought, look, either I care about music or I care about money. And I decided that I didn't care about money. And the kind of people I was meeting were at record, large record companies I had come into contact with them were, uh, I just regarded them as fuckwits basically um, you know not the kind of people that I'd normally want overseeing my work which is what it was they'd always want to put a producer in charge of me uh, I was just anti everything you know whatever it was I wasn't taking it I turned down two record deals just told to fuck off I was offered two major record deals and I just like that, and they couldn't understand it. They said, what are you going to do for money? I said, what does it matter to you? I'll go out and dig a ditch, you know, at least it's honest. Mm. And at, or work in a factory, at least I don't have to have the overseer, you know, you know, in a factory I don't have to share a, the same toilet with, a, with my overseer, you know, whereas in a record company I probably would, you know. And mm. I, I don't see what you've got to do with music. I was completely resentful. I can remember how angry I was at the time. And then when I stayed angry for about five years. What about when was this, for time period? About, about 81 to about 86, probably. Mm -hmm. I softened in the end, but it's still suspicious. Yeah, right. I had a rough time off the bastards, you know. I mean, that, that, those few records I had made, I didn't make any money from them. And I wasn't a particularly good businessman. And in the end, I sort of gave up trying to work with them at all, you know. I, I thought they were incredibly corrupt. And I also thought that uh, co cocaine was to blame. I, I've always but their corruption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I always thought, yeah, I thought that the, as the American multi 
you know, the, the American multinationals owned EMI, so that, you know, it was all very well for a record company to go out with EMI and say we're against nuclear weapons, when they, they were hooked up with Thorne, who made nuclear components. And I, I couldn't kind of reconcile myself to that that kind of thing. I, ju I just thought, oh, they can fuck off. And they, they'd all take cocaine, and I think cocaine is a very uh, middle management kind of drug. It makes the mediocre seem good. And, it, and I, I looked at who was getting played on the radio, and I just thought, well, it seems to me that uh, the one with the biggest bag of cocaine uh, seems to get their record played on the radio. And I thought, well, that's not... In England, that's especially true. But I saw us also as being controlled by um, American multinational... They had the purse strings, so they were controlling things as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't having any of it. I thought, I'm better off digging a fucking train. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. I want to ask you a little bit more about the, the type of albums you were putting out with this, this band at the time, with the early 80s band. Uh, oh, the cassettes. Huh? The cassettes. We yeah. We just oh, brought cassettes yeah, out right. until well, 1985 or 86. Right. I, mean, I was really stupidly defiant, you know. I mean, I just would sort of... You know, people kind of say, "Hey, John," and I go, "Fuck off!" You know, like I was like, but there was a lot of humour involved in it. You know, as well, like we'd we just sort of someone would ring up and say, "Oh, uh, we've heard you've um, made this uh, cassette," you know, and uh, we've heard some of the pop songs are really good. And I say, "Yeah." So I say, "I'd say we'd like to um, sell some," and I say, "Good, I'll send you ten. And uh, and um, this is what happened to one record label. They said they'd like to put my music out, so I, I said, well, I'll do what I do with all my anarchist distributors. I'll send you a, uh, a photostatable um, cover, and you've got to cut them out and cover them in, and I'll send you ten. And when you've sent, sent ten, you sell them for three quid each, you send me a quid, and when you've sent me that, I'll give you some more. And they, I pretended that's what they were, and they said, no, we want to put a record out. And I'd write a letter back saying, oh, no, the claims from Venice don't make records. And they'd say, well, we'd like to like you to make a record. And I'd say, no, 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 we can't do that. And um, they'd say, why not? And I'd say, well, I've got this gardening job and my friend's doing a cleaning job and we haven't got time. And they'd be just sort of like, what the fuck are these guys doing? You know, they couldn't understand and we'd be at home going, <coughs> we'd, be, we'd be laughing our heads off, you know, like probably cutting ourselves out of money, but it just like, it's a short circuit these people's brains. It was, right. that, it was subversion, you know. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring the government down. I wanted to bring the record companies down. Mm -hmm. I wanted to destroy the world, you know. <laughs> it was fun. Bit of a fun. Yeah. Yeah, someone thought it was a joke. Oh, the music. Yeah. The music was getting really good. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the music was actually getting quite good. It, so was, it was fun. It was rough, you know, but uh, yeah. it, was, it was like good tunes. Mm -hmm. Three minute pop songs. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, a few backward guitars. I was starting to develop it, you know. I, I thought, what sort of things do I like? What really lights my candle? But I didn't. There was a limit to what we had, you know. He said cheap guitars and sometimes a cheap drum machine, sometimes a drum kit. And um, gradually, I got better at it. And eventually, I think I allowed a. I can't explain it unless you heard it, but sort of not dissimilar to what I've got now, rather less polished. That's all. Is that going to be made of? Will that be made available eventually? On yes, I think it probably will, because we have a compilation called Golden Cleaners. But that was the records. Mm -hmm. But the plans are to, to, to release the stuff from the best of the tapes, and bear in mind there were ten cassette albums, probably, at least ten cassette albums. Oh, how, so how, we, much, how much material on, on one cassette? Oh, anything up to about twelve songs. Wow. Usually, usually somewhere between ten and twelve songs. Mm -hmm. Now, of those tapes, at least... I should imagine there's about 30 songs worth hearing mm -hmm. of the whole lot and other stuff that we didn't put out. Mm -hmm. We just threw it at the wall, you know, we do. We were churning out stuff all the mm -hmm. time. But then we, one of them got made into a record. One of our, be our best tape, we really got better and better and better until one day a, rec a German record company said, we'll release it. And I thought, sod it, why not? Let them put it out, I might make some money. And, uh, you know, like years and years of poverty by this time, it kind of soften me up a bit as it yeah. does and uh, so I released it and it was, it was a hit in Germany mm. yeah. so but getting back to the, 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 the stylistic uh, uh, well you can hear some of it on if you've heard Golden Cleaners mm -hmm. Golden you know, Cleaners like yeah, yeah the, if you've heard Golden Cleaners the compilation mm -hmm. there's uh, I think two tracks mm -hmm. from our early tape days on there uh, from that 
particular thing, which was called Under Wartime Conditions. Uh, um, one of the tracks was called Summer in a Small Town, mm -hmm. and another one was called Drowning Butterflies. Mm -hmm. And both of those were done on a four track in my bedroom. Oh, yeah. And that is what those early cleaners tapes used to sound like, although they were rather prime examples of it. We did stuff that wasn't quite as good as that, and we did stuff that was maybe as good as that. But mm -hmm. That was the best so far, and it had taken us to about 1984 mm -hmm. to get that good. 1985 mm -hmm. got released in Germany. And to our astonishment, I mean, I didn't believe this was happening. These sheaths of reviews would arrive. I'd be off to my washing up job in a restaurant, I had a part time washing up job. And, uh, and the, this fucking great pile of stuff would come through. I'd say, oh, I'm not really good at German. Um, I'd give them to a German teacher, and he was a rather camp northerner. Uh, he's a head of languages, actually, at a grammar school. And he, he'd, I'd buy him a drink, and I'd say, Well, what did they say then? Everything? He said, Well, oh, Martin, I can't really understand this, but. Uh, these people seem to think you're some sort of genius. Like that, you know, and I'd go, what, what, what does it say? And he'd say, well, you know, and he'd read out all these reams and reams, every one of them, and premium reviews, you know, mm. and I'd think, oh, I wonder if I'll get any money out of it. <laughs> of course, I did get a few royalties out of it, uh -huh. but that record company, in the end, they never fucking paid us, and we shifted loads. They, they went out on import to America, mm -hmm. everywhere, you know. I mean, it was a popular album. Huh, oh, yeah. Because of that, we... Eventually signed when I met after I met Captain, we eventually signed to a British company who promised us artistic freedom, which is what we got. We made our second album. Am I going too fast? No. Do you want to, tell me when you want to break. Well, let me just first of all just yeah. back to him here. I'm wondering, uh, do you think that in you know in, in your quest to sort of perfect the, the three-minute pop tune, does your Englishness enter the uh, the uh, equation at all? Oh yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Defiantly almost parochially English, you know, <laughs> not domestically English, not even, you know, certainly not patriotic, just, you know, this is kitchen sink drama, as we call it, you know, it's like, you know, writing about when you the say, minutia, you what, know. What, what does that mean? When you kitchen, kitchen sink drama, yeah. I didn't know, I didn't know whether Americans were familiar with that expression mm -hmm. or not. Uh, well, uh, parish pump, yeah, does that mean anything to you? Parish pump, no. Parish pump, uh, parish pump politics, um, where, where you're literally in a village and it's just the, the, the stuff like whether we're, there ought to be more litter bins on the playing field mm -hmm. or whether there ought to be someone to clear up the dog duty on the, uh -huh. on the playing field or, uh -huh. or, or whether we need some new um, new curtains for the village hall, stuff mm -hmm. like, you know, on that level. I see that. that, I mean, kitchen yeah, sink, yeah. you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, really, small stuff, you know, I would write, write about the things that were around me because Hemingway, one American writer, actually said that you should write only about what you know and not to go down much of it either. Uh -huh. so, um, so your Englishness is, is mm. a, defin a defining element thing? Of course, yeah. Not out of any patriotism or nationalism, but because uh, it is that strange and quirky little land which bore me and uh, I sort of like it a great deal. <laughs> so what do you think about uh, acts like you pointed out Blur a second ago? Um, they sort of well, Blur, bands like Blur and Suede, uh, oh, and, and to a certain extent Morrissey, I regard as really encouraging because for years, uh -huh. uh, artists like myself, Captain Sensible, Robin Hitchcock and XTC have languished in obscurity in our own country because of the, uh, basically because of uh, American colonial, uh, you know, cultural colonialism basically. What's happened is that our youth now have Back to front baseball, hip hop. Back to front baseball. Catch hip hop. Eat in McDonald's. Drive cars. Watch all American films. And um, there is a small core of people, not just my generation, but my other generation, who think, "Hang on a minute. We, you know, we're not good at much, the British, but we can turn out a good pop tune when we want to." Um, and these these people, t you know, and we can't even sell it in our own country, not because of a, of the the people, but because the record companies are getting all this stuff from America. And we, you know, I think it's a bit stupid, really. It's typical British, though, that we invent something and can't market the fucker, you know. We're not actually very good. We're good you know, a lazy bunch of bastards. We're good at inventing things, but we cannot market stuff. And, and so some of the English chats breaking through, like Suede and Blur, brilliant, because they're young, they're handsome, you know, they're sort of spunky, you know. They're, you know, they're hot, they're gintry, they're sexy. And, um, and Morrissey, of course, is just immaculate. He's such a good wordsmith. He's a poet, really. Uh, so they're, they're the English who are breaking through. But uh, it will help to redress the balance. It gives hope to... Because, you know, XTC are huge in America, huge in Japan. In England, 
people saying, are XTC still going? Uh -huh. Captain Sensible. Whatever happens to Captain Sensible, you know? Yeah. And he appears on television sometimes. I think I'm about as famous as Captain now, and he was a really big pop star a few years ago. Right. Right. You know, so have you been to England a lot? No, I haven't. You know a bit? Oh, good, good, well done. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to talk to someone who hasn't been there. Uh -huh. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of good to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think and Blur's latest album is just immaculate. I mean, it's a really good pop album by young guys. I, I, I'd given up hope that any generation would ever pick up that torch. I mean, if we're all getting into our late 30s and 40s now, mm -hmm. the punk generation. Mm -hmm. And it's taken me a long time to break through anyway. I'm a very slow developer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's brilliant to see yeah. young guys soaring around. These guys are fucking good. Yeah. But you have to admit, I mean, you said that English are failures at marking this stuff. I mean, you, you played a large part in the... Uh, failure yourself by sort of turning your back on, uh, on, on the business. Oh, he did, but um, XTC really tried. Yeah, but I was I was, young, I was unique in that respect. I was a defiant bastard. Mm -hmm. you know, I, was, you know, I was really, you know, it's, it's defiant to point of stupidity. Mm -hmm. oh, I recognise it. I'm not, you know, without so, <laughs> criticism of myself. I've so mellowed a bit now. certain degree of culpability there. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. Yeah, How about a guy Paul Weller who started out very English and then... Oh, Paul Weller's good. Yeah, I forgot. I should have mentioned him. Yeah, but he, he talks about him maybe taking a bit from Curtis Mayfield or maybe taking a bit from Neil Young oh, along the way. Well, now, you also talked to Captain about Paul Weller because, you know, Paul Weller is good and, and in England he's one of the few English artists that they've got any time for. But he's... Uh, I have watched that man shamelessly magpie his way around <laughs> the way around the bloody I mean you can either say charitably he's got eclectic taste or you can say he's bloody shamelessly nicked. He started off on the Who. He went right through, you know, the the soul stuff. He finally got onto Curtis Mayfield and uh, and and now he's busy sort of like pillaging Spencer Davis group and uh, traffic. You know, it's a bit naughty. And uh, yeah, he's upheld as a you know a great artist and people like Andy Partridge and Captain who are, you know, really trying to push push barriers back. Uh, as, uh, there's no, there seems no rhyme or reason in it. But no, Paul Weller is, is uh, he's a craftsman. I, ca I can't sit here and say he's bad because he's not. But he's been more, he's been more guilty of, of um, a certain amount of plagiarism than some other people. You know? So, so he gets high marks for craft and low marks for integrity. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't say integrity, that's the wrong word to use. I think he has a great deal of integrity, especially politi politically. Mm -hmm. he's, I think he's a good chap. Mm -hmm. I met him once or twice. Uh, he's, uh, he's OK. He's a bit humorous, maybe, I'd say, personal there. He's not, mm -hmm. not much of a sense of humour. But, um, <laughs> but he's... Uh, now, I wouldn't say integrity. I'd say in his early days, he, he wasn't too original. He did shamelessly plunder things a bit. But then call it his own. He wouldn't... But whereas I, I would just say, if someone would say, uh, you've, uh, you've nicked that, I'd say, all right, it's a fair cop, Governor, slap the brace. <laughs> I'll come quietly, you know. And I know Captain would as well. <laughs> Don't worry. Are you very interested in uh, American music at all? Uh, yes. I mean, it's a long kind of question here. I mean, this this okay. extra part of it may be rather extraneous, but you were saying, like, Andy Partridge, uh, you know, when when XTC did the Dukes of Stratosphere yeah. uh, parody type thing, they were uh, not parodying, but uh, doing sort of a... Affectionate trivia. Aff Affectionate trivia, that's the, the, the mm -hmm. exact words I was looking for. But like, you know, the, the, the Blues Magoos or the Electric Prunes, uh, maybe among the more obscure stuff. Yeah. But in, in your own case, are you interested in that sense in... in the American the psychedelia? Yeah. Right. Not as much as the English stuff, but I, I loved Quicksilver, mm -hmm. and I liked Moby Grape, mm -hmm. and I liked the birds. Uh, I really liked Todd Rundgren. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of very fine American music, you know, that I, I've heard that I like. Mm -hmm. But I was never, um, I can't honestly say it influenced me as much as the English stuff. There was no point. That came from America and it was good and it was most interesting to listen to. But my search was always to find something that was sort of inside of me and, and directly around me, you know, around the parish, around the immediate... Uh, yeah, Smallsville, as you call it. Yeah, so so yeah, the American stuff. Yeah, it was. I did actually listen to it a lot because my friends liked it a great deal. Was so I heard it whether I liked it or not, but I did actually get to like a lot of it, mm -hmm. especially those bands I mentioned, Quicksilver, Moby, Great, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, Top Rundgren stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that an old 
found it interesting that you listed those particular acts because the one thing they share in common is they sort of drifted off into obscurity. Um, is that something that you find uh, that you sympathize with? No, not really. Uh, I see a certain res resonance. Res is it a, a story, a, a situation that resonates uh, more so for you than... than you can call Todd Runger an obscure. Yeah, that's true. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I know that Skip Spence is uh, a bit of a casualty now. Yeah, so that's I heard so that, which so. I was pretty sad about, really. Yeah. Um, but I didn't like, I didn't like Jefferson Aeroplane sort of thing so much, mm -hmm. you know. That was just... Um, and I did yeah. quite like the Grateful Dead's um, attitude, but I didn't yeah. always like their music. I liked one of their albums, American Beauty. Mm -hmm. I liked one Captain Beefheart album. Uh, what is it? I liked the really early Mother's Invention, but I didn't like the stuff that subsequently came. Mm -hmm. Well, I, of course, I had my Frank Zappa. But this idea he's Beach Boys, I preferred. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I really liked. Yeah. 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 Okay, but, but anyway, he, he was kind of going off on the wrong yeah. track, I think, there. The, the obscurity thing about it appealing that that side of it, the non-music side appealing to you? No, I've, uh, I liked, I liked pop music mm -hmm. and that sort yeah, of Yeah, that's it, doesn't just that? Just pop music. Mm -hmm. I didn't even like rock music. So mm -hmm. I didn't like it when it started getting arty. I, I thought the whole idea, and this is quite important, it's quite central to my belief, but the whole idea of pop is it should be about three and a half minutes long. Mm -hmm. If you listen to a piece of classical music, the bit that you remember and the bit that all the, you know, potatoes remember, even if they don't know classical music, is the... Uh, the three-minute bit, you know, the eighteen twelve overture, the uh, you know, the salient bits, and they're all about three minutes long. So we we gather that the human attention span for immediacy in a piece of music is about three minutes. And so I thought, well, if it that I like that idea, and if if it can be said, you must say it in three minutes because and not regard it as a restriction. This is a cage to be brilliant in. You function better under rules, you know. Mm -hmm. I found mm -hmm. in, in my autumn years. <laughs> How about uh, accusations of persons such as yourself or Andy Partridge or, or creating music in sort of like a greenhouse? Does that does that offend you at all? What do you mean in a greenhouse? I like guess sort of isolated, sort of uh, in, a, in a vacuum of space. Uh. I don't regard it as a I don't regard it as a criticism. I regard it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm isolated. Yeah, I'm I'm out on a limb. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, it, but it belongs to me, sort of thing. You know? mm -hmm. I'm not really concerned what anybody else is doing. I'll listen to it. Mm -hmm. I'll keep an ear on it. But I'm quite solipsistic like that. That, that is the belief in self is the chief good. And I, I will just think, right, well, I'm doing this. And um, if they don't like it, I suppose I'll have to go and be a dustman or something. You know? And if they do, I'll have some money. And, you know, I'm just going to do this. Mm -hmm. I think, I, you know, you can, uh, you can only get truth in life. You just, just pursue it mm -hmm. without regard to, Actually. you know, trends and fashion. Fuck right. fashion. Right. Right. You know, I'm not doesn't really make any difference. I didn't yeah. expect to be doing pop at this age anyway. I was quite happy with my career as a writer in, in England. <laughs> they asked me to do another record, you know, and I, I thought, yeah, that could be fun. But I'm only going to do what I want to do. And of course, <laughs> the fact that Andy Partridge is asked to produce it has made it even more so. I'm, I'm rather glad about it, actually. No, it's uh, an accusation, though. Mm -hmm. A compliment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, can you agree with the theory that, that pop music matures with the age, with, with with the with the era with the, with the current day does it mature along with it or is it is it a separate entity does pop music mature along with the time with the times mm -hmm. right, so this as short as I can you have to translate this in chunks um, <laughs> pop music has not only cannibalized itself it has, it has eaten itself from the arsehole inwards. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. And the reason it has done this is reflects not only short-sighted record company greed and the fact that in the old days a record company would pick a band, let them get on with it, help them develop a bit with the idea that they were going to mature and get better. Now, Pop artists are seen very much as a short-term, high-yield investment. Wax some money into them, make the vid, give them a great big budget on the album, give them a big push. If they fly, great. If they fall, dump them and find a new one. There's no safety net. Now, that's very short-sighted. It's the equivalent of getting a golden goose who's laid a golden egg. Hey, it's laid a golden egg. 
Let's see if it's got another one inside it, slit it open. You've got another golden egg, you've got no goose. Instead of, hey, this could lay more golden eggs. Let's feed it, let's see where it likes to live, let's see what it wants to do. And that has changed. So in other words, super capitalism has taken place, but that is only reflective of how the tech, we are suffering from uh, what Alvin Toffler, a great American author, called Future Shock, which is a, a, a sort of um, a super technological revolution. From sort of this is your dot here, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Industrial Revolution, American Revolution, French Revolution, yeah, like that. Suddenly, uh, the two wars, uh, like that. And then suddenly, just after two wars, off the graft. You know, off the graft. And then, and then the technology not only goes up, it hits the ceiling and explodes out. So this revolution in communications has not only gone upwards, it's exploded outwards into all our lives. And we simply are psychologically and spiritually unequipped to deal with it. And so pop music has a shorter and shorter shelf life. People have shorter and shorter attention spans. And music has become increasingly factionalised with, with the result that we find ourselves in this recycling mess that we find ourselves in now with the Americans saying, well, rock music's like this, it's like this, so we make it like that. We get the boys, we get the air machines, we put out the vid, they all go... <laughs> and some people like that, and some people like... Am I going too fast? So... so Really, everyone's fucking lost because of this huge rush, this energy rush and the technology, and um, it's difficult to see what will happen. So what I've opted to do is to perfect the idea of writing a song. So if I can write songs that are built to last, I might frame them in ornate little psychedelic sort of period frames, but hopefully, if they're good, like a, a Cole Porter song or a Lennon McCartney song, in the future, when all this mess does get sorted out, someone may come along and say, hey, that old Git Newell, he wrote some good songs. Um, let's do one in a modern way and see if it's any good. And I think they will maybe find those songs bear a modern translation. At the moment, I frame them in the only frames I know how to build. Mm -hmm. I know how to paint a picture. I, uh, I'm not interested in putting them in a modern frame because I don't know what a modern frame is. Mm -hmm. you know, can you get... Have you absorb all that and translate mm -hmm. it? Yeah, no, actually, no. what we do is that this gets translated later. Oh, right, okay, I, I, just, I, just I forgot, I, I quite frequently forget that things on, yeah. Yeah, so okay. we, you know, I just They're sort of... They're giving a gist. I, every now and then, when he yeah. asks for it, in the interest of time, I cut, we cut out a lot of it, which on spot mm -hmm. and triple. Okay. Out of the email, so the, the reason why that question came about is because when you talk to this uh, British band called the Autours... Oh, the Autours, yeah, yeah. yeah. The they were talking about how you know, how they are a very English band. Yes, they are. And they... They're pretty good. And they were likened to the Kinks, or they likened themselves to the Kinks. However, but in, because the Kinks are also a very English band, so they Yes, say. of course. And, but they said the, the difference is that the Kinks represent a sort of Englishness, a, a bygone, an Englishness from a bygone era, whereas they represent a, a contemporary Englishness. Well, the Kings haven't written a really English... Dave Ray Davis hasn't written a really English song. I mean, they used to in the mm -hmm. 60s, like right that. Since the 70s, they got very big in America, and they do a rather uh, kick-ass style of music that is not at all redolent of what they used to do. And the last Englishy sort of thing they did was the vaguely Calypso-like um, Come Dancing, mm -hmm. which was just Ray Davis remembering things. Um, I don't even know if Ray Davis would agree with them being English now, but there's an idea of what the Kinks were. At the time they were doing that, yes, that they were bang on. To do music like the, like that now, yeah, you could say it was a, a, about of a bygone age. Um, I've been, uh, well, not accused, but probably well complimented on sounding like the early Kinks, and it's true that I do share that thing with Ray Davis about writing about England in a very domestic way, as I've said, you know, concerning myself with the small things. But if you check my lyrics, you'll find that I'm writing about current situations. You'll find I'm writing about England as it is now, you know, with awareness of what it was. But you know, I don't. I, I wouldn't deliberately. That's the trouble with a lot of the a lot of the a lot of young sort of would-be English bands send me tapes, and they always try and imitate what was, whereas I follow a, th a thing that, I, I, it's a, an old saying, I'm not sure if it's an oriental one or not, but it is, follow not 
in the footsteps of the ancients, but seek what they sought. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to imitate the Beatles or the Kings, I'm trying to find what it was they were looking for, because I think they were looking for the right things. How did it feel to, uh, to be focused in on, as, as a, I guess this, people started seeing you as a, as a poet, a certain yeah, certain, England. yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what what how did you feel about that at the time? I mean, you've been, I guess you well, it was a <laughs> it was a good um, good consolation prize after not becoming a pop star, which is what I I was sure I was absolutely sure when I was about nineteen. Well, just, obviously I want to be a pop star. You know, that's the reason I just thought the world won't see me languish in obscurity. You know, they were only too happy to see me languish in obscurity. <laughs> yeah, and um, I was. Uh, you know, I was exhausted, I was knackered, I'd been through the mill. By, by the time 1989, 90 came, I'd had it. I'd had it with pop music, I was quite happy to put down my guitar forever. In fact, I did put it down for a year and didn't pick it up again, having played it every day since I was like 13. I just stopped playing it and I concentrated on my writing, which I'd been doing all the time, but which I'd always just had as a second kind of thing. And so when I... I thought it was beginner's luck. I thought, this can't be right. I, I'd only been sort of actually come out of the closet as a poet, really, about a two months, and I was in the bloody national press, then after that I was on the national radio, mm -hmm. and other poets who told me, oh no, poetry is very hard, it takes years to crack through, and I was quite, quite prepared to sit down and become a silver-haired old writer, I thought, that's it, satisfying, that, that's what I want to do, I want to walk my dog, dig some garden, walk around the countryside and just be some old man and maybe some stuff will be discovered when I'm dead, you know, I really didn't expect it to happen. Within about three months I first got published and within six months I was national and then it's just, I'm kind of like, you know, being a famous poet in England is not like being a pop star. People don't say, oh that's a famous poet, but people who do poetry, they know who you are and that counts for a lot, like I'll, I'll get in the papers, you know, the a national newspaper, the Independent, I write for regularly. They'll ring me up and give me the front page of features sometimes, just to say what I want, as long as I do it in verse. And uh, that is quite a compliment, and I I think it was uh, God's way of giving me a consolation <laughs> prize. I did say it was like God had smacked me in the face, you know, I said, you silly bastard, ripped the guitar out of my hand and put the tire on. I said, that's what you should have been doing. And and yes, poetry has been a, a much kinder mistress to me than uh, than music ever was. And And then after that, because I got known as a poet, uh, people suddenly remembered that I used to have records out. On my bio, my initial poetry bio, it just said, used to be in pop groups, that's all. I, I wanted to forget it that much. I've been so cut up and drained by the thing. And uh, I did actually just brush it aside, say, do you still play music now? No. Do you um, want to, you know, would you play something, you know, do you want to do some music at this concert? No. I don't do it anymore, you know. It was, it was that, it was that sort of cut up like I did actually after about a year, start knocking about with local bands. They say, "Hey, we need a bass player tonight." Go, a couple of nights, you've got a couple of nights, and I'd go and do it. Oh, we need a keyboard player. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, we're doing Ziggy Stardust. Uh, we want a second singer and a room. Oh yeah, I'll do that. All right, okay. But and people said, "Martin, you ought to get back into doing music." I said, "Nope." And it was it took Kevin, Captain, and Andy Partridge to persuade me. And that is quite some heavyweight persuasion, I tell you. When you've got someone like Andy Parsh, who I admired, had admired for years, saying, um, make an album and I'll produce it. Uh, I thought, how can I say no? When I mean, Kevin said the money was available, and I wouldn't go short of my travel expenses. And who, who's Kevin? Kevin's the record company boss at Humbug, and let me tell you, they're quite a unique record label. Mm -hmm. yeah, really that, that, that is what label? Humbug, that is Humbug, the record Humbug. label in England. Yeah. They are quite unique. Yeah. I thought Agreed. you were talking about Germany again. No. Hamburg. No. <laughs> Sorry. I've been to Hamburg. I've been to Hamburg. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's good. And I made this one record and I, just, I said, one thing at a time, Kevin. He said, will you do any gigs? I said, well, never to her. And I won't. But I will do odd gigs. So he managed to just coax me out like a dog that had been kicked too often. You know. So he uh, won't. No, I'm not having that. Because last time he gave me a biscuit and then I came out and they kicked me. So I gradually said, oh, it's biscuit, you can have it, 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 you can have it,
I don't, can't wait to get back in the studio again now. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's good. So, throughout your, the, the many vicissitudes of your career, the ups and downs, uh, has, have you ever thought that, uh, oh, I'm like such and such a person? Have you ever likened yourself to another historical figure or artist? Ah, um, well, actually, when, I, when I'm in despair, what I do is I, I do read a lot of history books, and I go back and I read about, I read, especially read about lives of poets, and especially poets who've come up from, you know, the, from the country, really, that didn't come up from a privileged background. Uh, yes, I, I do. I likened myself to him, but no, there are certain things when I've read about people's lives and I thought, yeah, I thought that. And the more I read them, the more tolerant and calm I become because I realised that it wasn't a personal thing, the world hadn't got it in for me, that, that uh, all art is struggle and that probably no good art comes without struggle. And so, yeah, I've read about a poet called Robert Burns, a very famous Scottish poet, another English poet called John Clare. Um, a fa my favourite English poet, A. E. Houseman, Alfred Edward Houseman, who, due to a buggered up education because of family, family difficulties, ended up working a dead end job in a patient's office for about 10 years. He, he did that. And I read about the early lives of Sid Barrett and John Lennon, of course. Um, and I've actually had a chance now. To, to talk to people that I have admired. But yeah, I do. I take great inspiration from reading about the lives of great men uh, and women. And sometimes American people as well. Oh. Yeah, no, I mean, like American artists, apart from the English ones that I, I've mentioned, you know. But Mark Twain is an interesting case in mm -hmm. point. Uh, not so much Hemingway. I think, find him a bit rough. I, you know, him and I don't like the macho writers, that guy Mailer, you know, Norman Mailer. Mm -hmm. You know, a very, very good writer, but um, sort of brutal, you know. I, I read the stuff and I think, this is not a nice chap, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd like to be stuck in a bar with him. He'd probably punch me out or something. He'd call me an English faggot, you know. <laughs> you know. It's very local. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Mind you, I'd uh, find out what hotel room is and stab him. <laughs> the English are like that, duplicitous <laughs> bastards. <laughs> no, normal mail is good. Uh, and I liked especially, though, Gregory Corso, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. I don't know if you come across them. Yeah. Beat poets, oh, American from, beat yeah, poets. Ferlinghetti, brilliant writer. Uh -huh. Fantastic. Gregory Corso. Not so much Alan Ginsberg, although you have to admire his cheek, you know. Mm -hmm. He's just a bit too wanton, really. <laughs> Good old Damon. Kind of a last question here. Oh, anything. Any kind of beer. Kind of a, a game-like question, but he was wondering what... Uh, so, no, I, was, I was thinking of my beer, not... not, not yeah, carry on as long as you want, I'll be, you know. But I just, it's my beer gland, you know, start playing up that. <laughs> That's right. Five, five, time for that sundown. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> just wondering about, over the XTC albums, what's your favourite and what's your least favourite? That's very hard to answer, because with any band that I like really a lot, it's like if you asked me what my favourite Beatles album was. If, I, if you asked me now, I might say Rubber Soul. If you asked me last week, I might have said Revolver. I think with XTC, the first one that really, where I thought, this band is stunning, was uh, Black Sea. But um, Skylarking's good, but Skylarking's like Sgt. Pepper with the Beatles. It's the greatest album, but it's not necessarily my favourite. You know, you, it becomes, because it's so familiar, you... You know, like, you, you, it's cheap, you know, because of that, you know, so like, you, you go looking for mm -hmm. rather more obscure things. I've never liked Let It Be by the Beatles, I, mm. I always thought that was their worst album. I'm trying to think what, what XTC's worst album was. Worst album, um, that's very difficult, you know, they've made two difficult albums, Mama and Big Express. Was it difficult, really? I thought they were, I thought they were difficult albums, mm. but I I actually like Mama a great deal. Some of the, the salient points on there are really good, like Lady Bird. And are you an XTC fan? That's my life. Oh right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, because um, I think if I was stuck on a desert island, one the one I'd least like to be stuck on a desert island with. Who the earlier stuff? The earlier. Go to and, and white music. Some of some of um, go to is a bit of, a bit of yeah. skill, I mean. No, it doesn't need. Probably well. do with that white music, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't that crazy about oranges and lemons. 
Mm. I, I do like Nunsuch. I was, I was kind mm -hmm. of relieved they did that. Mm. So that's got some real depth to it, especially Rook. Mm -hmm. Rook is brilliant, so mm. it's staggering. Andy, Andy said he knew he'd made a kind of quantum leap when he wrote that. No. Oh yeah, he wrote it and he just thought, fuck, you know, that's... You know, because you go for ages when you're writing songs and you, you write, you write, you get to a certain stand and you think, great. And then you think, well, I'm bored now. And it takes ages, then suddenly you go in the, in the wilderness for ages, then suddenly you just get click, and you've gone up a gear. And you've gone up a grade, you think, right, I must never sink below that. And you, you constantly try and get better all your life. Mm. I start with my great songwriters, you know, like, um, Kurt Vile and um, Cold Porter, you know, really immaculate, timeless songwriters. Rogers and Hart, those people who, in fact, of that generation, I think the American songwriters have rather more... They they, prefer, they honed the art of the popular song pre-Beatles to about its highest point. <laughs> that's what I think about. Okay. Yeah, again, where I say, yeah. what's the thing with that This this is kind of a tough one. Um, for, for this for the stuff you're going to be making, like for 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 future material or for new, for material in the, the not too distant future, for say music you have in your mind right now, or music you would like to do, I'd like you to list the three songs of other people that would indicate a direction, like songs you would want to borrow from judiciously in order to uh, solidify, like say, like a concept or an idea you have. If you could list like three songs from other people like is, that m maybe indicate the direction you want to go in, is that possible? It's difficult. It's probably not impossible. I might have to think about it for a little while. Um, I'd like to write something like My Funny Valentine, on one hand. Mm. I'd like to write something like um, Tracy Jacks by Blur, yeah. on another hand. Yeah, I think that's a fucking great song, that. And um, that's, that's two, isn't it? I really like that's, my candle. That's pretty good. I didn't think you'd be able to come up with any of That's amazing. And, um, yeah. Uh, Maybe something like, um, well, you always strive towards that, but something like Getting Better All The Time by The Beatles. That's a pretty good song. Or Fixing a Hole, something, you know. Mm -hmm. something, like that, something of that quality, mm -hmm. that, that depth and quality. Mm -hmm. But something like, because the Blur song, because it's just so full of energy and joy, you know. It's got straight in. Tracy Jacks, nah, Tracy Jacks, and it just goes up, you know, you think, yeah, brilliant. It's full of, it's really uplifting, you know? Uh -huh. mm. Something uplifting like that. Uh -huh. That would get someone dancing around with a, a, an air guitar in their bedroom in mm -hmm. front of the mirror. Something that would do that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Who was that? I had um, uh, bow tied, um, well meaning. No, no, these, are, these are the people who are the artists uh -huh. and the people who, who have been artists and made a living from it, but they're all a bit older than me and very dignified. Mm. And I'm. The sort of scumbag Yobbo who's recently made good and is coming to respectability due to sheer, sheer weight of stuff published now. And uh, I think uh, probably, I don't know, I don't know if they really care, but I, I, I think Blur would be quite astonished to find that I was such a fan of their stuff. Mm. I am. I think they're, you know, currently the best band in England. I think I think Blur will, I'll go further, I'll say Blur will save the world. When Blur <laughs> made their first album, and Damon has got a reputation, in fact they all have it, but not so much Dave the drummer, but they've got a reputation in cultures for being arrogant, especially Damon, and difficult. Mm. And, and what you said to the rock press, we'll be making our Sergeant Peppers round about the fourth or fifth album. And people going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like now, they've heard this one and they're thinking, yeah, be frightened, be very, very frightened, because they're fucking good. By any, even the, the cynical English rock press have greened mm -hmm. over this one, you know. Q gave them a, Q magazine gave them a double page, and, and it was warranted, it's a cracking album. Yeah, it's good. No, I want to, I'm a Yorkshire I think so, so, if you do see David, uh, give him my regard, mm. show me press kit. He'll probably know who I am, but mm -hmm. uh, he might not. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how much well, stuff he reads. Well, I'm going to see a message for him on there. <laughs> <laughs> play it to him. Okay. Good luck to you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Go out and take the world and fuck Colchester. <laughs> Yeah. All right, I guess we okay. have some, our photographer, photo Mr. Hatta, is, is waiting over here. Oh, I just got to check myself in the mirror. Yeah. Uh, is he going to have lots of light? All oh, right, lots of light. It's got to wear some shades for this.
Yeah, yeah it looks like he's, he's got. Well, a, he's been playing since he's been in Japan. Oh, really? Yeah, he's got a big setup there. So. Yeah. So, Vima Toya.